was that uh, uh, sort of the epicenter of, of uh, a lot of change in health here for the last couple of years. So let me begin by simply saying, yes, the lines are blurring. Uh, they are blurring. And um, I'll give you my take on why. Um, I, I would first say that it's important to look at each of these situations where health plans are getting into the health care delivery business, or providers are getting into the health plan business, or they're working in together in different ways than they have in the past. It's important to look at those case by case or region by region. And I start with the thesis that the healthcare delivery is largely now a regional set of activities in practically every state across the United States that I've been in, uh, involved with companies up and down the East Coast. Uh, it's, you've got a series of markets in Florida, you've got the same thing in Georgia, you've got the same thing in North Carolina, Virginia, uh, Pennsylvania, right up the East Coast, and it's, and it's all over. But those are the markets that I'm most familiar with. On the health plan side, we've got, of course, consolidation uh, to fewer plans. You've got uh, United, uh, Aetna, Cigna, uh, Humana, and uh, what else am I forgetting? WellPoint, but if you include WellPoint as part of the Blue Cross Network, um, it's, it's really uh, the Blue Cross Network and a handful of national players, other than the disruptors who are trying to come in and make some change, and that's going to be interesting. So for either group, but let's take a look at the regional health plan companies and the regional provider companies like uh, um, uh, North Shore Long Island Jewish or um, UPMC or Geisinger, for example. Two reasons I think that they're getting into going across here on the other side. One is the true belief that you can create better value and do population health. And there's some merit to that. The other is, is really a market protection mechanism, a market preservation mechanism. And it's one or the other or both. And I think regardless of what side you're coming at it from, uh, those are the operative forces that are causing decision makers to do what they're doing. I know that was the uh, operative uh, thinking and that was what was driving our activity uh, when I was at Highmark. This did not start with the ACA. It's been going on, uh, and you've had groups uh, like Geisinger, Kaiser Permanente, early in my career, and Kaiser Permanente is the, the ultimate blurred line. Although if you go inside the Kaiser Permanente organization, they'll make it very clear that they're not one organization, that they're two organizations. <laughs> this Mike knows he's learning as a newcomer to Kaiser Permanente. <laughs> but you had health providers who've been in the health plan business in the past, largely with marginal success, uh, never scaling to national size. You've had large health plans uh, dabbling in the health care delivery business during my days with <coughs> Prudential. Uh, it was the largest of the major players before they were acquired by Aetna to get into the health care delivery business. And we did in the Southeast, and I was part of that, and also the Southwest. Uh, that was the heyday of managed care, and then we know what happened by the end of the 90s. It kind of got folded up and, and um, taken down. And so is today different? My quick answer would be uh, to echo what Mark Smith and, uh, and Mitchell Blood said this morning. Yes, I think it is. And why is that? Yeah, I think it is because uh, there's a sense among all players that the, the, the game is fundamentally changing, and it's not going to go back to the way it was, and that we've begun to reach tipping points in terms of cost. I think the high deductible health plan um, movement has accelerated that a bit, and actually the ACA, I'm not sure the, the uh, architects of the ACA envision this, but they've accelerated the high deductible health plan because the most successful plans on the exchanges are the silver plans and the bronze plans that are high deductible plans. Uh, and so people are, and then in turn, that's driving the creation of narrow networks to meet that price point. And we saw that uh, in, our, in our market. <clears throat> so what is the 
challenge is you're coming at it from the health plan side or from the provider side. I think it's, and I've been in both cultures, uh, and been on both sides, negotiated with health plans as a provider, negotiated with uh, providers as a health plan executive. And, uh, and, and the most recent was overseeing two uh, business unit presidents that were trying to figure out how to work with each other. Very interesting dynamics. First of all, the cultures are very different. And bringing them together truly uh, is, is a challenge. And there's not a large repository of people that have worked on both sides or that have substantial experience, but that's one challenge. Second is you really get right to the, 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 the uh, meat of things in terms of uh, when you start talking about how to divvy up the dollars, who wins and who loses? Is it the health plan? It's going to take a hit on their margins, or is it the provider that's going to take a hit on their margins? And, and uh, so, because you're trying to bring the money and pull the money out and get to something more efficient. Uh, and so, managing that dynamic, that's a big issue. The second big issue is if you're taking costs out and you're truly trying to provide higher value care, that's what we were trying to do at Highmark, we were also trying to protect market share. But let's just stick with that first reason. Uh, you don't get to higher value unless you take out people. You've got to remove people. If you're really going to be more efficient, you've got to take people out of a process. There's a more efficient way to do um, cardiac care. You're going to do MRIs or imaging for a lower cost. Some of these jobs got to go. So managing that transition to risk-based payment is really tough. And I'm not sure anybody has mastered it, but look for, if you want to try to identify the successful companies, look at those that are successfully managing that transition, getting physicians involved, uh, because some of these ox is going to get bored. So that's, those are two of the big, uh, big challenges. The, the last couple of points I'd make is one on the consumer side. Um, I think it's very important that consumers have choices. Uh, that they have information and that they not be locked out of those choices. In the market there in Western Pennsylvania, of course we operated health plans in, in all of Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Delaware, and actually national accounts in all 50 states. But just focusing right there in that local market, uh, what concerned me as an executive, as a leader, as a business leader in that community was that people were, because of the sort of interesting level of the warfare there, uh, people were actually just losing choice. Uh, I believe that people should have the choice to go to a non-network hospital and not at full dollar. The, in, in our case, the UPMC organization literally wanted to close its doors as a community institution to people who are willing to pay simply to exercise their, their market power. And that's a question regulators have to face, so that, that gets to the regulatory issue. The health plans are largely regulated by state departments of insurance and now to some extent by CMS. The providers are, are, are regulated by attorneys general or the, um, or the uh, Department of Health. There is no single regulatory framework, and that's something that's going to have to change. So, uh, in summary, I think uh, as you look at the emergency of these organizations, and there'll be more, brand is really important, but so is cost. And narrow networks are a good thing, in my, in my uh, estimation, for getting to a lower cost delivery system, higher value. Uh, obviously, the ultimate nirvana is to have a, a, a narrower or a broad system uh, with lots of choices that's also low cost and high value. Uh, that's going to compete very well in any market, right? So, just some thoughts to summarize, and I'm interested to hear what uh, you have to say. As John mentioned, I'm uh, Joe Shulman. I'm the executive director of uh, what we branded as North Shore, uh, North Shore LIJ Care Solutions. And provide some context uh, for those in, uh, in the audience who aren't as familiar with North Shore LIJ. Uh, North Shore LIJ Health System is uh, the third lar largest not-for-profit uh, secular uh, health system in the country. We, uh, we have about $7.5 billion in revenue. Uh, we operate in uh, many of the boroughs of New York City uh, and across Long Island. Um, our network also is beginning to expand north uh, into uh, Westchester County, and we have um, 
affiliations and collaborations in New Jersey, as well as uh, collaborations with the Cleveland Clinic um, just recently. And then just to provide some context about North Shore LIJ also, North Shore LIJ as a health system uh, is afforded um, a substantial uh, share of our market service area in terms of uh, the market share that we have. And um, there's no question, and, uh, and as I, uh, I reflect, you know, I, my role is uh, the one of having the privilege to stand up the care management organization with a physician partner of mine, is that it's that, uh, that, you know, that famous book, and, uh, and it really couldn't be any more true uh, what we're seeing, which is uh, the uh, providers are from Mars and the payers are from Venus type of thing that's going on here. Uh, and that's the way we feel day in and day out, it seems. But uh, and now we have become both Mars and Venus uh, because uh, we did launch our provider owned health plan, North Shore LIJ Care Connect, uh, about approximately a year ago. And that's when we talk about the content here and the topic about blurred lines. Um, this is an on exchange and off exchange uh, offering and products uh, that we have available. Um, when we talk about from the provider domain, uh, first is what is our identity? And that's one thing we look at very carefully and we say, what's the identity of our health system? The identity of our health system has obviously this, this large density of healthcare delivery services. We operate 17 hospitals, that's just today, I don't know what happens tomorrow, it'll be 18 tomorrow. <laughs> but 17 or so hospitals um, across our region. Um, we have over 400 plus ambulatory, uh, ambulatory sites both practices and uh, ambulatory procedural sites, uh, significant ancillary services as well. Uh, we have a, a research, research institute that is uh, certainly has some scale and a, uh, and a pretty substantial teaching enterprise, which is anchored and we're most proud of our recent, the recent development over the last several years, what, which was the, uh, the opening of our uh, School of Medicine in collaboration with Hofstra University, the Hofstra North Carolina J School of Medicine. So, that's the first order of business is you really, we have to look deep within ourselves and say what's our identity and what are we really committed to for our communities. And then, um, that's first step, but then we really now as we're venturing into uh, certainly a whole nother phase of, of reimbursement and, uh, and demands and we talk about value-based care. It was pretty evident, uh, like many health systems that enjoyed and enjoy a, a significant market share a, posi a significant position in terms of market share that, um, and we're, we don't hesitate and we're pretty direct in, 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 in defining this, certainly the way the systems are engineered is you become addicted to fee-for-service. And that's essentially what has become. And that addiction is not something that was obviously intentional. Clearly this is about engineering the, it's the saying about every system is engineered to get the results it gets. And, um, and this is what we're reflecting on clearly and we know about and everyone in this room recognizes the unsustainable element here associated with the cost and the utilization so there are three components um, and then I'll describe it a bit I'll spend a little bit of time about our journey and our decision uh, key decision points about standing up care management risk-based contracting and the like but those three points were, um, were very important and that is when we talk about high value care delivery and utilization we're uh, unequivocal that we are committed strategically. And there are many different perspectives on this across the country um, in providers that are similar to ours and systems of scale like ours. Uh, but we're pretty unequivocal in terms of what our strategy about. Certainly, we have to become the highest value care delivery system in our marketplace and beyond. There's no question. We have to deliver the highest value. It's not just cliche to say because um, it's, it's very important that we define what does that mean. And there are some three basic anchor elements we've been, we've been utilizing. One is that we have to be committed, obviously, to the utilization issue. There's no question that there is, uh, there is certainly a utilization issue that is occurring in our, uh, within our space, uh, that there are substantial opportunities from a care coordination standpoint and settings of care. The second of which is to, uh, to identify all necessary utilization and have systems and arrangements and uh, market position to have all necessary utilization occur within our care delivery system. And that can, that's a very, it can be a slightly looser definition or it can be a very hardened definition in terms of owned and operated. But keeping it within our care delivery system is essential and uh, guarding against, out, uh, against the leakage the out-migration, the need to repatriate individuals to our health system and our healthcare delivery network is vital. And the third, which is garnered and garners 
a uh, substantial amount of support from the providers and from our professionals that operate with, and uh, clearly that uh, serve within our health system, and that is guarding against underutilization. That's another element that's very important that as part of the endeavor and having a provider born, uh, a provider born and provider spirited endeavor here, it's, it's sending the message that clearly we're going to be incredibly thoughtful about how we, uh, about how we move forward. But that thoughtful nature can't be uh, a position of vulnerability either. And there's no question that we have plenty of work to do in this, but that's an important message uh, that we send. You know, when we really look about the, um, that fourth element, it really it was interesting because it, it used to be where our strategy was price, this is a famous saying from, uh, from our managed care officer, is price, price, and price, and those were the three strategies. And uh, this, was, uh, this was in the past, right? And now it's clearly, there's no question, it's about, this is about the member, this is about the, youth, the lives, this is about the volume, right? This is about, and when we say volume, it's when, I, I have to qualify this, it's about necessary. It's the, what's necessary. And then we also need to define as providers what definition of value are we subscribing to? Uh, Tom Lee has a, uh, a great definition of a uh, value that, that um, is, is pretty telling, and that's about value is defined what matters to matters to patients and families, at the, and relative to the cost of delivering that value, and that's very important because we have to obviously balance both of these. So um, the context of North Shore LIJ is that still today. We're, uh, we're at 93% of, uh, of the reimbursement and the revenues that flow through our health system are still within a conventional fee-for-service model. 7% are in a uh, form of risk-based or alternative reimbursement, uh, alternative reimbursement programs um, and arrangements. So this is one of the most challenging periods, there's no question, because you have a substantial amount of your base revenue and the revenue that that is uh, keeping your organization care delivery system alive uh, for even extraordinary preparatory events, although high, low likelihood, like what we're seeing now um, in the marketplace in terms of infectious disease and Ebola and things of this nature. But um, we know that that's, these are substantial outlier situations, but it's about preparation, it's about having an organization that is equipped for high complex care delivery. At the same time, it's, um, it's important that we, uh, we move forward and we move forward in a big way. And we talk about the chasm, and we've all read plenty of articles about how do you transition. Um, and you have to be very careful uh, not to martyr yourself as an organization. So it, um, it, it becomes about partnership. I mean, this is what it's about the partnerships. It's about having insight about your marketplace. And that insight is um, about relationships and the potential relationships with the payer community. It's about potential relationships, obviously, with large groups whether they be IPAs uh, and, the, and all large medical groups and the like. It's about relationships with the communities, and it's about relationships, obviously, with your employed, uh, employed uh, staff. And that's something that we're, uh, we're obviously spending a lot of time on. So um, just to give a three-minute pre uh, primer uh, just about care management, and then um, I'll stop there, and then I know the questions will bring out uh, plenty more information is we decided clearly about a year ago that uh, we had no mechanism and no vehicle to, uh, that was responsible to manage the implementation, performance, and measurement of our risk-based endeavors. So, um, and that was, that was clear. Uh, at the same time, we, uh, we had made a strategic decision to launch our own provider own health plan, CareConnect, uh, to be uh, on the exchange and off the exchange. So um, approximately about that time, we decided uh, as an organization, Michael Dowling and members of our, uh, of our leadership of our health system uh, decided to make the investment and move forward uh, and have an organized care management endeavor and a care management en uh, enterprise. We're very fortunate uh, because clearly we were able to be inspired locally uh, by the work that Montefiore has done in this space. Uh, that's uh, very local and then obviously much broader across the country, the models are uh, those that you're very familiar with, whether it be Geisinger Intermountain, uh, whether it be Presbyterian in New Mexico and the like. Uh, Kaiser is another obviously extraordinary example. Uh, these are organizations that have been doing this quite a while. And that's something that our health system uh, is becoming, uh, has to become, we're becoming much more uh, 
comfortable with realizing that this is not a three-month endeavor. This is not a project. This is not a, uh, a fleeting type of cir circumstance. This is, uh, we're not planning anymore. This is, yeah, that's right. And I, I was with one of our uh, physician executives, and he said, well, as part of the planning for, uh, to enter into risk, or as part of the planning, I said, there's no more planning. We are in it. This is it. It's here. It's now. We can, we, there's always planning. There's always strategy. We need to discuss the now and, and what our tactics need to be, what our position needs to be as a health system. So um, we have multiple activities underway, whether it be CMMI activities, and uh, I can provide some of that in, in, uh, as the discussion moves forward, whether it be bundle payments. We're involved with the Pioneer ACO in collaboration with Montefiore. We have the Independence at Home projects and house calls programs and the like. We've deployed embedded case management, and, and we really have a recognition that, uh, how the, obviously, everyone here recognizes the power of the analytics. Um, we just recently had a press release about our, uh, our venture with Explorus, the Cleveland Clinic product, that will power our big data uh, and analytics and our predictive modeling. In addition, Optum Analytics is something that we leverage as well. So um, just the, the several, the final points are that from the provider domain, the timing is, is the challenge. It's really about the pace. Uh, it, it is in the now. We are here. Our system is, again, unwavering that we are moving in this direction. I feel very comfortable to say that uh, and speak to you here on behalf of, uh, of our system leadership and on behalf of Michael. Um, we're, moving, we're moving very swiftly. We're moving very thoughtfully. And, um, and we're, we have to have both eyes open. Um, and we cannot be conflicted. We have to confront the conflicted feelings about this because this is what our, our communities rely on us for. So with that. I'll Great, start. thank you. So um, two years ago today, I was asked to speak with a bunch of 28-year-old uh, kids. Um, these, uh, these kids happened to run a, a fund. Uh, they were involved in Instagram and Spotify and a few other uh, consumer-focused uh, internet companies. And they said, uh, we decided we want to start an insurance company. We don't know anything about insurance, maybe you can help us. Uh, and I basically thought that, um, you know, no, a, a for-profit insurance company hasn't been started in New York in 20 years. So I went home and had my martini and <laughs> said, I'm going to continue my retirement and good luck. Uh, so, and then I uh, thought about it some more. And uh, after a few more calls, I uh, began to think about, so what is the opportunity around disruption uh, around the insurance market? And what are some of the trends? And what I'd like to do is share with you some of my thoughts around what those trends are and how Oscar is kind of taking advantage of those trends. The first trend is uh, a real focus and a change of, uh, in how the uh, insurance, uh, insurance is sold. Uh, historically, it's been sold as a group product. Uh, it's sold to the HR department. Uh, There's now a dramatic change in how it's going to be sold. It's going to be sold as a, on an individual market. Uh, it's going to go from about 10% to, to estimates about 40 or 50% of both the public and uh, uh, private exchanges. And that means a dramatic change in how uh, the insurance companies need to respond. Uh, if you're focused on the HR department, you really don't focus on the individual, you're not focused on marketing or branding, on engaging the patients. Um, and uh, this is really a, a dramatic change for insurance companies. Oscars focuses on the branding, on the marketing. Uh, we hired the uh, former uh, director of marketing at uh, Disney uh, and developed a whole marketing outreach and enrollment uh, engagement plan. Uh, and now we have about, as people enroll, 80% of them fill out the health risk assessment. Uh, and any given day, 5% of our uh, uh, members are, uh, are online uh, with us. The, uh, the second uh, big change is around um, how people use the internet and apps. Uh, there's a generation that's coming on that uh, uses, uh, uh, to get a cab, they use Uber, even I can do that. Um, they use uh, Air B and B to uh, uh, get vacation homes. Uh, they uh, use Instagram to uh, uh, take uh, manage their pictures, and I can go on and on. There's no reason they're not going to think that they're going to be doing the same thing around healthcare to manage their healthcare using these uh, apps and, and uh, capabilities. They're also going to expect convenience and a real consumer experience when they do this. So this really opens up a whole market for uh, different types of companies that can develop apps, provide information, uh, and provide alternative sources of care. 
So there's really no reason why. How many people really understand the insurance certificate? How many people have read it? Uh, oh, good. One. Two. <laughs> there's really a, it's, un, it's undecipherable. So one of the things we've done is, uh, is made that into, into English so people can understand it. Um, we've simplified the explanation of benefits. So who can understand their explanation of benefits? It totally it makes no sense. And um, it was really, it's, it's just the most ridiculous document I've ever seen. So uh, we now have one that's really pure, very clear, very easy to understand. So now of the 100 employees we have at Oscar, only 20 of us are sort of the insurance uh, people. It's sort of, uh, they call us the suits, they're the hoodies. Um, and um, so the hoodies are now developing and working on the websites, mobile apps. Uh, they've simplified the explanation of benefits, uh, how to find a doctor, you're able to make an appointment, you uh, press a button, you'll have a doctor call you within less than an hour, often within 10 minutes. Uh, they're developing uh, mobile apps uh, and working on various other types of programs that are really brilliant in how they engage individuals. And from the medical perspective, that's, that's really exciting because once you engage people, you can potentially uh, manage their care in a different way and ultimately impact through that mechanism the, uh, and eventually bend the, the cost curve and impact their, uh, their medical care. Uh, the other uh, major trend uh, is around, and it was mentioned, this high deductible issue. And that's really uh, here to stay. The Accountable Care Act, uh, I think, has now solidified that. Uh, the high deductibles can be as much as $6,600 for individuals. All of a sudden, that shifts the responsibility uh, onto individuals to manage their care. Uh, and they need to begin to understand the need for price transparency uh, capabilities of doing that. So we've developed an app and a care router that enables people to begin to look at their doctors, compare quality, compare costs, uh, and begin to make uh, wiser decisions. And not only that, if they find a particular doctor they like, they can then press a button and ultimately uh, make an appointment with, uh, with that doctor. They're also gonna be looking for alternative ways of getting that care. Uh, why should they be going to a high cost hospital uh, when they could be going to a walk-in clinic. Uh, why should they go to a dermatologist if they can take a photo of their rash, send it, to, uh, send it out and get diagnosed and treated uh, over the phone? So we're working on developing these apps, uh, including the dermatology one, a behavioral health one, and a number of others. Uh, lastly, uh, there's a real trend in uh, capabilities around data and analytics. Uh, not only uh, combining data from traditional sources like electronic medical record, um, claims, uh, pharmacy, but also non-traditional sources like uh, economic status, uh, educational level, and also real-time data. Uh, we're uh, engaged with the, the Rio in New York, which tells us when a patient's going to be uh, being admitted to the ER. So we can do an outreach immediately to those patients and make some types of, types of intervention. We like to think that we're uh, increasing the velocity of care for some of these uh, capabilities. So what does this mean in terms of the uh, provider uh, and uh, insurer uh, relationship? Uh, uh, clearly, there's, there's a trend towards merging of uh, providers and, uh, and insurers. Uh, just look at, um, you know, Monarch is bought by Optum uh, in New York. Uh, WestMed has been bought ProHealth. Uh, there's a merger uh, in Allegheny and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, as, and Highmark. Uh, Humana's uh, bought Concentra. Uh, it's estimated about 50% of, of the providers uh, will have, uh, provider systems will uh, take on some sort of risk in the future. So um, despite what I think many people hope, I don't think that means the end of the insurance company. I think the insur insurance company has some uh, significant and important roles and values that uh, providers can't bring, ranging from uh, engaging uh, patients, ranging to uh, data analytics, uh, population management, and supporting those, those capabilities. Um, and um, they have the information over a full, full period of time, as well as have a real motivation to move people from the high cost centers to the low cost centers. So uh, I, I believe that despite uh, this uh, merger of a number of, uh, a, merger, a number of these entities, both providers and insurers, that ultimately there's really going to be much more vertical integration where insurers provide the data, provide the engagement, uh, provide alternative sources and ways of, of of obtaining care, and uh, and, payers, and and providers do what they do best, which is really managing patients and ultimately enabling them to manage a population of patients.